Silence becomes cowardice when occasion demands speaking out the whole truth and acting accordingly. And this week's opening quote comes from Mahatma Gandhi. Welcome to Surviving the Matrix, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maxwell Egan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again, and I will be your host for the next hour. Well, pretty desperate times here in Australia, ladies and gentlemen, with the fire front that we've got here, an enormous fire front across New South Wales and across Queensland as well. Something like over 100 fires, over 150 fires burning in New South Wales and Queensland at the moment. In fact, we have so many fires burning that the smoke from the fires in Australia is reaching New Zealand and causing a haze in New Zealand, and not to mention the haze that it's causing for people in Sydney. Sydney is quite literally blanketed in smoke most of the time at the moment. And that's kind of how it is here as well. We've got so much smoke in the area here. I mean, depending on which way the wind's blowing, but at times it's very difficult to see a half a mile through the sky. You know, you just can't see the mountains even in the distance because the area is so full of smoke. It makes breathing very difficult as well. But so much of the East Coast is burning at the moment, and these fires are the direct result of government mismanagement. They are the direct result of intervention by government. They are a deliberate set of events that have been put in place by the Australian government. They have nothing to do with climate change, which is, of course, the line the government and media is pushing. But the fires have nothing to do with climate change and everything to do with deliberate mismanagement by the Australian government, by the federal and state governments. And that's the truth of the matter, ladies and gentlemen. These people should be taken out the back and hauled off to jail for what they've done. I mean, the level of destruction we are now seeing in this country at the hands of these incredibly corrupt criminals posing as politicians is quite literally unforgivable. And you can watch them, folks. They'll fob it off. They'll blame each other. They'll say it's this and it's that. And they'll blame everybody else for doing things that they shouldn't have done. When in reality, it's all of them. It's the entire tribe. It's the lot of them. Every politician in this country should be taken out the back of the building and dropped into a pit. And even now, all of the responses that they're offering, it's all about climate change and all of this sort of stuff. You know, we had one demented moron, some, I don't even know who it was, one of these politicians is so stupid that he called some politician who was still supporting the coal industry, called him an arsonist for daring to support the coal industry. So this is what we see, you know, they immediately turn it into some sort of a political football and try to figure out how they can get votes from the event. Yeah, you know, it's just the way they go. And not that I support the coal industry, but the coal industry isn't responsible for these fires. But this is what happened. We saw a politician call another politician an arsonist. And just think about it, folks. I mean, we've got the country burning to the ground, and this is their responses. This is the level of their mentality. You've got politicians calling other politicians arsonists simply for supporting certain industries when it's got nothing to do with the industries. And the fact of the matter is that all of the politicians in this country are arsonists for the situation they've set up in this country. And I'm not kidding, folks. It is true. They are all arsonists, and every single one of them is responsible for this situation and for these incredibly destructive fires that are burning throughout this country. And these really do not seem like they are normal fires, most especially the ones in New South Wales do not seem normal. Some of the areas that are burning are incredibly lush rainforest areas. It seems incomprehensible that these areas could be burning, but nonetheless they are. Areas quite close to my home are burning. Areas that I'm very, very familiar with, it's very, very sad to see. An interesting thing about it, though, is that the fires are stretching from Forster in New South Wales right up to the border, the Queensland border, and in fact, they actually go a lot further than that. We've got fires right up the Queensland coast as well. Virtually the entire east coast of Australia is on fire. But in as much as New South Wales, they follow the line from Forster all the way up to the Queensland border. And as we've seen on so many other occasions with fires all over the world, the placement of these fires seems to just coincidentally follow the route of the new high-speed train line that they wish to put in up as far as Lismore anyway. 
the fires kind of go inland from there and go through the mountains. This isn't anywhere they'll be running a train line. But from Forster to Lismore, all of the fires seem to follow along the route of the proposed bullet train, high-speed train, that they wish to put in from Melbourne to Brisbane. And that may seem like just a coincidence to you, but you think about it, you know, a lot of people along this train route may have been very opposed to selling their land to have a bullet train go through. But now that a fire has ripped through the area and they perceive the area to be unsafe to live, they're going to be a lot more likely to sell their land and they're going to be selling it at a lot cheaper price than what they would have got for it had there been a house on it. And of course, the other areas that the fire is ripping through that are not privately owned are all national park. And of course, the people of Australia wouldn't have wanted the government to pull down areas in the national park to allow a bullet train to go through. But if these areas have just been burnt out, well, it's just as easy to put the train through there, isn't it? It's not going to cause any harm to the wildlife or to the environment because the environment has just been turned to toast by this fire. And this is what we saw in California as well and what we've seen in other places as well. And these fires are very, very unusual, folks. They're burning very rapidly and very hot. I would suggest a lot of it is due to the amount of aluminium that has been sprayed all over the forest from the chemtrail spray. And also they seem kind of unusual and quite contrived. There has been suggestions by people that this is the same as what we saw in paradise with directed energy weapons but i honestly can't say that i've seen anything to confirm that i mean the fires are certainly odd but not quite as unusual as the fires that we saw in paradise california but we have seen some kind of anomalous things here but nothing that can be used to confirm the use of directed energy weapons it's not the same as what we've seen in California with the fires in paradise where we saw buildings that turned to white ash, cars melted and all standing right next to trees that were unburnt, leaves still on the trees. And these are pine trees that should have burnt up very easily. And they don't appear to be burnt at all. And, you know, we've seen similar things here in Australia, but not anything like we saw in paradise. Though I did see one photograph of a burnt out car that appeared to be standing next to a wheelie bin that was unburnt, but I can't be sure if that's what I was actually seeing. That was a photograph that I saw on the news, so I'm hoping to be able to find it online. And if I do manage to find a copy of it, I will include it in the video presentation that's going to go with this radio show. Or maybe I can even find that news report again. You never know, they might post it online. And this is similar to what we saw in Paradise, where there were pictures of cars right next to wheelie bins that were still intact. It's interesting though, you know, sometimes you see these pictures and you only see them once and then they're never shown again. I remember on 9-11, on the day that it happened, I saw video footage of a white plane that looked like an AWAC flying across the Pentagon, flying away from the Pentagon just after it was bombed. But I never saw that footage ever again, never saw it online. I only ever saw it live on TV on the day that it happened. Interesting stuff. But suffice to say, we have seen some of the same very peculiar circumstances surrounding these fires that we've seen in the fires that we've seen all around the world recently. And it's been outrageous this year. I mean, there's been so many fires this year. Folks, of course, they're attempting to blame it on climate change when it is clearly not the result of climate change. And as I said, there are many people who are attempting to suggest that these are directed energy weapons that have started these fires. But as I said, folks, I can't really find any evidence of that. Not like what we saw in Paradise. And the thing is, this is Australia, and you don't really need directed energy weapons to start a fire in Australia, folks. This is a very, very dry country. To start a fire like this in Australia, all you really need to do is throw a cigarette butt out a car window or even to smash a bottle on the ground. I mean, I've seen fires start simply from broken bottles on the ground with the sun being magnified through the broken glass. And as I said, this is a very, very dry country. With the circumstances that have been set up here, this is literally tinder dry. And with the mismanagement that's happened in this country to set these conditions up, you wouldn't need directed energy weapons to start a fire here. All you would have to do would be flick a few matches around in a couple of strategic areas and you're going to get this type of result. So I'm not quite sure that it's due to directed energy weapons, such as people are saying. One thing I can be certain of, though, that 
the main contributing factor to making these fires as bad as they are this year? Because as I said, we get fires every year in this country, but the main contributing factor to making these fires into the firestorm that we currently see, what this is due to is deliberate government mismanagement. And climate change has got nothing to do with it, folks. Climate change is a massive industry and it is nothing else. The concept of man-made climate change, anthropogenic climate change, everything that's been pushed by Greta Thunberg, I mean, this is all complete rubbish, folks. It's about pushing the economic model over the human experience. It is a massive industry. It is a massive push for economic control of the human experience, further economic control of the human experience, and further lockdown of the human experience. It is an attempt to push out the smart grid. It is a massive industry. It is a control system, and it is nothing more. You know, climate change is such a scam, and it is not responsible for these fires. They're trying to pretend that it is, but of course, we know that it isn't. You know, and if there is one thing, well, another thing that is responsible for making these fires so bad this year, because as I said, we get fires here every year, but if there is one thing that has really contributed to making sure they really go off with a blast this year is the Green Party politicians who've been preventing people from burning off for the last three years. And very interestingly, just the other day, they announced a change to their environmental policies and the introduction of new environmental policies for the Green Party, and where they're allowing backburning and they're being a little bit more lenient in the way they've done things. Very telling, ladies and gentlemen, because that's what's caused this problem. It's been one of the big things that has set up this situation anyway. You know, through the introduction of what is essentially arsonist-supporting legislation by the Green Parties, you know, there hasn't been any backburning, hasn't been any fire breaks created, and even the original people who lived here before the Crown decided to come here and rape the country used to burn off all the time. This is a very, very dry country, and you've got to burn off, you've got to create fire breaks, you've got to create safe zones, otherwise you have outrageous bushfires come through. And honestly, this fire that we're seeing sweep through New South Wales at the moment, I mean, I've lived in this area for 50 years, ladies and gentlemen, 52 years, and I have never seen any fires like this. I've never seen this country burning to the degree that we are seeing around the area that I live ever before in all the time that I've been here. You know, farmers used to backburn. Farmers know how to manage their land. They've been doing it for generations. But no, no, here comes the bureaucracy. Now you've got to get permission to do anything. You've got to get permission if before you bend down and change your socks pretty well if you're out in the country these days. And so now they're not able to just do the things that they would normally do to maintain their farms. Now they've got to get permission from stuffed shirts in Canberra who've never visited the country and have no clue how things are run. And it's all about money and bureaucracy and signing on the dotted line and making sure everybody's heads up, everybody else's asshole, and everybody's getting to skim their little bit of cream from the top of the pie. Because that's how politics works in this country. It's just one economic jerk off. What's in it for me and how much can I run off to the bank with to my hidden account in the Cayman Islands? Rather than simply letting people do what they know how to do and do things properly. And so this is what you get as a result. You get the whole country going up in an inferno. And it is literally an inferno out there, ladies and gentlemen. The firefighters can't fight fires like this. This is literally an inferno, what is happening to the Australian countryside at the moment. And I don't know how they're going to stop this. I really don't. I mean, if we don't get some rain soon to put this out, and there's no rain forecast at all, then this fire is just going to continue burning, and I don't know how far it's going to go and what they're going to do to be able to stop it, but it is an inferno. And truly the most disturbing thing about it is that it is a preventable inferno. All of this has been done deliberately. And that's the truth of the matter, folks. All of this has been done deliberately by bureaucrats with their heads up each other's ass in Canberra. And that might shock a lot of people, me making that statement, but it's true, folks, because all you have to do is look at the circumstances surrounding these fires. And when you put all the pieces of the puzzle together, you look at how they've diverted all of our water out from the central Australia. They've taken it all up for 
Chinese mining operations. This is something that I mentioned last week on the show, the fact that the government is selling so much of our water to Chinese interests and the Chinese are taking this water. They are using it mainly in mining operations that are happening in the Northern Territory and in Northern Western Australia. And the creeks are just very dry anyway, but you add all of this together, the way our water has been so badly managed, all of the chemtrails spraying, the aluminium they've been spraying all over the forest for so long, the fact that the Green parties have legislated that no one can backburn, and so all of this extra scrub has been able to build up, and you see that this has just been an event that's been waiting to happen, and it would very much appear that this has been a very well orchestrated and very well planned sequence of events. Well, at least the situations to create the environment where this could happen seems to have been well planned in advance. And again, it is quite telling and quite coincidental, of course, that they want to build a new high-speed bullet train along the path where many of these fires have gone. And not only that, but of course, setting up these environments where these huge bushfires are going to take hold and doing it all around the world, it's happened everywhere, not just in this country. It also creates the concept in people's minds, it promotes the notion that global warming is real, that climate change is real, and it helps the politicians push their business model out across the world. When, as I said, folks, climate change has got nothing to do with these fires. This whole situation has been set up very deliberately, and all you've got to do is look at how things have been run for the last few years. Just connect all the dots, folks. Look at the Chinese influence in this country. Look at the mining operations. Look at the diverting of water that's happened in the Murray-Darling Basin. Look at the legislation that's prevented backburning. Just look at what's been done, folks, and all of the pieces of the puzzle fall into place. And you know, this isn't the result of incompetence. This is the result of deliberate mismanagement. You know, We know how to do things properly, and the politicians have looked at all that, and they've deliberately done everything backwards to the way it should be done. And, of course, there is a reason for that. And like I said, folks, it's not the result of incompetence. It's deliberate. I mean... Nobody is this stupid, ladies and gentlemen. You Really, nobody is this incompetent. Think about it. You know, they just want you to think that it's incompetence. They want you to think that they're stupid. But, you know, claiming they're incompetent is simply letting them get off easy because, no, it's not incompetence. This is very, very much planned and very much deliberately being done. There's also a weather report that was sent to me by someone. They went to the Bureau of Meteorology and they grabbed a little sample of cloud patterns over the Gold Coast, over the Queensland, New South Wales border, the area where I live, and they appear to be pushing the clouds away. There appears to be some type of electromagnetic interference, and to be quite honest about it, I mean, it, it honestly does very much look like the harp activity that we've so often witnessed, which is pushing the clouds out of the region. And you think about that, folks, and this is very unusual cloud activity, and why would they be doing that? And also think about it, consider the possibility of cloud seeding. I mean, we've got these huge fires burning all over the country. Why aren't they seeding clouds and bringing rain? Oh, what, they can't do it? Of course they can do it. They're often talking about cloud seeding. So why aren't they seeding clouds? Why are we seeing anomalies like this on radars, which appear to be pushing the clouds away from the affected regions? You know, all of these events have been set into motion purposely. All of this situation for this to occur has been contrived. Even the funding that they pulled from the volunteer fire services just a few weeks ago prior to these fires breaking out, and even the rural fire services, the legitimate rural fire services, haven't got the money that they're supposed to have. Government simply isn't funding them to even do the job they're supposed to do. And that seems to be quite deliberate as well. I mean, all you've got to do is look at all the evidence and connect all the dots, folks. You know, these sorts of things don't happen all at once by coincidence. They happen by design. You know, I think this is a deliberate and a controlled burn. That's what all the evidence is suggesting. And I think this is mainly an attempt to burn the hippies out of the hills, folks. They want everybody to come to the cities. They want people to have the concept that it's just too dangerous to live in the country and that they all need to move to the safe zone of the cities. This, again, is all part of Agenda 21. It's what we saw in Victoria a couple of years ago and certainly what they're going to be pushing to the people in the aftermath of these fires as well. Just wait. You'll see it. It'll come. The media will jump on it. 
and push it into the minds of the people the way they always do. The way they're pushing so much fear into the minds of people with these fires as well. I mean, they're evacuating areas that really are nowhere near the fire front and they're putting out so much paranoia across the airwaves, attempting to get people really hyped up and really scared of everything that's coming. And I don't really think people should be leaving their homes. I mean, if the homes are defendable, I don't think the people should be staying to defend their homes because if you leave a home, if your fire is still quite a good way away and you leave your home, well, who's to say the powers of believe they be aren't simply going to burn the home while you're away? I mean, I wouldn't put it past these people. I really wouldn't. I really would suggest that a lot of this around the area where I live is simply being done in an attempt to push the hippies out of the hills. You know, and there's been so much going on in this country. I mean, this country is, is virtually being sold from underneath the people. It's been removed from underneath the people anyway. As I mentioned earlier, the incredible mismanagement of the water. What's happened to the Murray-Darling Basin? There's about three weeks' worth of water left in the Murray-Darling Basin. As I said, water is being siphoned off from the Artesian Basin and sold to China. China isn't taking the water back to China. They're using it here for mining operations. And we've lost so much of the flow from the Murray-Darling Basin that it's really starting to affect things in an incredibly bad way. And you find that all this has been done with Chinese money. And what's going to happen, folks? You've got the farmers in the middle of Australia all getting pretty desperate because they're just simply not able to maintain their farms. They're not able to produce food for the people in Australia. And if the farmers can't produce food, then there's not going to be any food on the supermarket shelves, folks. Now, when you go shopping, your food doesn't come from Woolworths. It comes from the farmers who sell it to Woolworths, and then they put it on the shelves. If the farmers aren't there, then there's not going to be any food in the supermarkets, folks. And that's the problem that we're facing. And you're even hearing some ministers in some areas within the media in Australia are encouraging farmers in hardship in the centre of Australia to sell up, saying it's time to sell up. Well, if they do, you're going to find that who they're going to be selling up to will be Chinese companies. The Chinese companies will buy up all of this farmland and then you'll find that miraculously all the river systems will start flowing again. Then China will own all the farmlands. They'll start growing all the food. All the good food will go to China and we'll be left getting the second, third and fourth rate food sold back to Australians, getting our own food sold to us at incredibly inflated prices while well, all the good food goes off to China because they happen to own all the farmlands now. All this is being manufactured, ladies and gentlemen. All of this hardship is being manufactured. Our government is fully in bed with overseas interests and they don't care about the Australian people. They're hanging the people of this country out to dry. And all of this is interlinked. All of the things that we're seeing are all connected, ladies and gentlemen. And it's all leading towards the same thing. And if you really want to know what's going on, just go and look up Agenda 21 and do a bit of research into that, because that's what we're seeing unfolding dramatically in this country. And you think about it, folks, China is Australia's main export. I mean, we send more material to China than any other country on Earth. If we were to break trade relations with China, it would virtually destroy the Australian economy. In fact, Australia is so dependent upon China, something like 15 or 25 percent of our trade. This is a huge amount of trade, and this is way too dependent to have ever become on a foreign nation. And it's got to the point now that if China wants Australia to do something and Australia says no, all China has to do is to say, well, we'll stop buying stuff off you. And that is enough to get the politicians scrambling over themselves to do whatever China wants. And by this mechanism that's been set in place, the politicians here in Australia are like little Chinese puppets on a string. They really are. And you'll find that most of the food that we grow here in Australia gets exported. A lot of it gets exported to the United States, but the majority of it gets exported to China. So if you think about that, looking at it from the Chinese perspective and a Chinese business model, it makes no real sense to be buying food from Australia when you can simply buy up the farms that the food is growing on and then send the food to China and sell the leftovers to Australia. That way you get to sell Chinese food to Australia and you don't even have to worry about 
transport costs because you're growing it all in the country there. You know, and the Chinese will do this. They'll set the whole thing in motion. They'll take over the farms. They'll start growing food. And then they'll get the river systems flowing again. And they'll say, well, you can't blame us for diverting the river system. Your government told us we could do so. I mean, we as Chinese would never do that. We would never deprive the farmlands of water because the farmlands are essential. And it wasn't us doing it. We were simply running mining operations. The government told us we could have the water. We weren't worried about the farmlands because we didn't own the farmlands. But now that we do own the farmlands, of course we're going to send all the water to the farmlands. We're going to make that a priority because that's what the priority should be. The Chinese are kind of sensible like that. But when you look at it from a business perspective, it makes perfect sense for the Chinese to be doing exactly what they're doing to the country. It makes perfect business sense from a Chinese perspective for them to be taking the water, for them to be using it in mining, for them to be draining our river systems and squeezing our farmers off the land. And it isn't anything nefarious at all. It's simply good business sense looking at it from a Chinese perspective. What is nefarious about it is the fact that the Australian politicians who are sworn to serve and protect the people of Australia have lied through their teeth, have sold the country out from under the people and have run off to the bank while they've been doing so. You know, this is one of the reasons they disarmed us so early back with the Port Arthur Massacre. This is why John Howard set that up. And the Port Arthur Massacre folks, if you think that was carried out by a young Tasmanian man with an IQ of a 12-year-old, you are sadly mistaken. The Port Arthur Massacre was very provably carried out by the government, and it was carried out for a specific reason, namely for the country to turn into the mess that we are now seeing. And all this has been contrived by the politicians, folks. So that's where the blame has to be. And it's about time the people of this country woke up to what's happening and woke up to the fact that this is not the lucky country. It might have been the lucky country once, but that was before we elected politicians to positions of management because what these people have done is absolutely disgraceful. And we're not going to get any remedy from the political system, folks. It's time for the people of Australia to rise up, form grand juries, and have these people arrested, have them held accountable, and have them transported to somewhere where they will no longer harm the people of this country and the people of the world. As I've said so many times, folks, I'd like to get every politician on this earth, put them all on Christmas Isle and give each of them a hammer and they can have their war. And we can be done with these people because these people have been the bane of human existence. They really have their homogenization of this earth and their complete disregard for the well-being of humankind, the well-being of anything but themselves can no longer be tolerated. And it is time for the people of the world to stand up and pay attention to shift into a positive state, shift into their heart space, shift into a place of love. Because once you shift into this place of love, you can no longer tolerate this type of evil. And you can see how easy it would be to shift the direction we are going if we simply were to open up our hearts to what it actually means to be human and get back onto our correct path. That's really what we need to do, folks. But I think we have reached break time here, so I'll leave it there for now. We're going to have a break. Thank you for joining me on the air today. It's always a pleasure to have your company. And I'll be back to speak to you again in a few minutes. Thanks for listening. And don't go away because there's plenty more to come. I'm not quite sure what that will be yet because I work all this out as I go along. But whatever it is, there will be more. So do stick around. And welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, yeah, so all this has been long set up. And as I mentioned before the break, the Port Arthur Massacre back in the 1990s when they disarmed the Australian people, this was very much a contrived event. This was very much a government-managed event. There is so much information out there about that that I highly recommend people go and look into it. In fact, I actually intend to make a documentary about the Port Arthur Massacre as soon as I can get the time to do so because I think it's an important piece of the puzzle for the people of Australia. But this has been set up. It's long been set up. I mean, they didn't disarm us because they wanted to keep us safe from guns. They disarmed us because they wanted to keep themselves safe from us. And it's been a gradual process since that point. You know, when they built the fence around Parliament House, why do you think they did that? Remember Julia Gillard was attacked, apparently, was on the news when she was the Prime Minister. They've had this incredibly comical event where they claimed that Julia Gillard had been attacked by a crowd of 
rioting Aboriginals and all this sort of stuff. It was an absolute joke, folks. It was the most badly acted performance I've ever seen. You had Julia Gillard being rushed down a flight of steps and getting away from the Parliament building with all these cops jumping around, literally jumping around, jumping up and down and bumping into each other to make it look like the day with the crowd and they were fighting off a crowd, but they weren't. They were just jumping up and down and bumping into each other and pushing each other to make it look like it was a big bustle. And Julia was actually smiling through the process. You could see that she was trying to play along but found the whole thing kind of embarrassing because it was such a comedy show. And it was honestly the worst piece of acting I've ever seen when they attempted to portray the concept that Julia Gillard had been attacked. And she hadn't. It was a completely staged event, folks. Complete fabrication by the police and the media. But they did that and it gave them the excuse to put that big barrier around Parliament House in Canberra. Why do you think they did that, folks? And they took all the guns away from the people, disarmed the people as much as they could made it so that, I mean, you're sure you still can get guns as long as they're not semi-automatic and you jump through seven or eight or 15 or however many hoops they've put in place for you to jump through and present it with a nice little posy and perhaps a box of chocolates, they may give you some sort of firearm license. But that's about it. So they've kind of disarmed the population of Australia. And since then, they've got all of our police dressing like Batman. They've all given them black Kevlar. They've all given them automatic weapons and all sorts of stuff. You know, they're fully armed, fully militarized, and basically domestic terrorists are wandering around now. And after that, then they've built this huge barrier around Parliament House. And then they proceed to set up a situation where the entire country is without water and burning and ownership is basically about to be transferred to China. Do you think this is all a matter of coincidence, folks? Do you really think this is just a natural cause of events? Do you really think this is the result of incompetence or bad management or any of that sort of stuff? No, folks, it isn't. You've been set up. We've been set up by these people and it's just going to get worse as long as we continue to fail to call it out for what it is. Like I said, folks, you know, we need to set up grand juries and hold these people accountable. Have a look at the work by a man called Wayne Glue. He's an ex-cop from Western Australia, I think. And I'll put a link to one of his videos below and you can just follow it through from there and find some of his other stuff. He's done some great stuff. And they're just waiting for this guy to die. I mean, I swear, this guy has done so much work on exposing the corruption in this country and exposing what they've done to the Constitution and everything. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, it's all invalid anyway. It's all just stuff that they write on paper. But, you know, if we're going to have anything written on paper, if we're going to have any type of law at all, then it needs to have some form of value and basis in law. And, you know, what these politicians are doing doesn't. Now, this country was hijacked years ago, and Wayne glue has been porting all of that out. You've got people like Romley Stewart from the Justinian Deception has been doing fantastic work as well. There's a channel on YouTube called Liability Mate. Now, he's been doing some great stuff. There's also Australian Patriots Radio. There's a lot of people that have been attempting to get this message out to the people of Apathralia, because that's kind of what this country is. You know, a really apathetic bunch of people, staunch bunch of people if you can get them awake and get them aroused. But if you don't, then they're just an apathetic bunch. I mean, they really are. I'd love to see them wake up to themselves because they're letting themselves get led to slaughter. But there's a lot of people that are standing up and doing a lot of work regarding this situation, folks. And that's a good thing. There's actually a guy called Mark in... Grafton as well who contacted me a couple of weeks ago there's a group in Grafton an action group so there is a lot of people in Australia that are starting to stand up and pay attention to what is happening and that's a good thing and if you're watching this on YouTube I will put some links below so you can find some of these channels and find some of the people some of the activists that are working here in Australia and get involved yourself if you're an Australian because the truth of the matter is that if we want to get anything done, if we want to make any headway at all, if we really want to change the direction that we're going, then we, the people of Australia, have got to unite. I mean, there's only 26 million of us. There's not a lot of us, folks. It wouldn't be too hard to get a decent groundswell happening in this country and unite and start pushing this back, you know, start pushing back towards government. And we have to find a way of getting the police to stop doing what they're doing. These order followers have got to stop following orders and start doing the right thing. Start doing what they can to protect this country rather than protecting politicians and supporting foreign interests simply because some sociopaths written it on paper. You know, we've got to get a little bit of consciousness back into the minds of these people and a little bit of humanity back into the minds of these people and regain control of this country while we still can. 
because we are heading for exactly the same position as what we're seeing happen to countries in Europe, what we're seeing happen to countries all around the world. I mean, it isn't just Australia. They're just using a different method to do it here. Yeah, but it's happening to all countries. The merging of all cultures, the homogenization of all cultures. And, you know, China is the one that is pushing all this out. But really, when you look at China, you look at who's set all this up. Well, there's a lot of Jayish people that seem to have funded the rise of China, the economic rise of China. And you look at what Israel is doing, you look at the hand that Israel has in all of this. Yeah, there's a deeper puzzle to the whole thing, folks. But irrespective of that, what we need to do to combat what is happening is get a little bit of focus on what is happening on the ground in our own countries and regain control of our own reality here in our own countries. If everybody can do this in whatever country they happen to be in, or well, perhaps we could get somewhere. The question, of course, is how do we do that? And, of course, the best way is to awaken the people around you to the truth of what is actually happening. You know, we are heading into a very, very different world, folks. We really are. A restructuring of the financial system, the rolling out of the smart grid that's going to go with it. This is very, very disruptive. It's going to change the way we do everything. You know, the whole New World Order global society, global culture that they've always wanted is about to come online. You know, there's still people in there saying, oh, this is going to be a good thing. This is not the Rothschilds. It's not Soros. It's not the old players that were trying with the old world order. This is a new version of it, and it's going to be great. This is what some people are actually pushing, but it's not, folks. It's going to be a cashless social crediting nightmare. That's where we're going. You know, all of the main tech giants in the world, about a thousand of them, are at a display right now at the moment, this weekend, or possibly last weekend, called FinTech in Singapore. And FinTech is short for Financial Technology. And this is all the tech giants. There's about 60,000 people at this conference, and like I said, about a thousand displays, and you've got all of the main players in there. You know, IBM, Microsoft, Facebook, Intel... Nvidia, they're all there, all the players are there. And even the large banking corporations are there because the banking corporations are about to be squeezed out. A lot of the main banking systems are looking at the future and going, hey, this is a pretty scary future for us because we're not going to exist anymore. And that's the way it's going to go, folks. All of these big banks are just disappearing. They're going to go the way of the dodo. But that doesn't mean it's a good thing because what we're shifting into is a digital crypto world and it's still going to be just as regulated, only it's going to be regulated by AI. And that's what's going on at the moment, this huge fintech conference in Singapore with all the main players there. And what they are doing is restructuring the financial system, the world financial system. It's all going to go crypto. It's all going to go digital. They're really, really pushing the rollout of a cashless society, a worldwide culture and a cashless society to go with it. And as we've already seen, it's all going to be run off social crediting, ladies and gentlemen. And social crediting and digital currency is the ultimate slavery system. No matter what sort of a happy face people attempt to put on it, it's the ultimate slavery system. There's absolutely nothing good about this technology. But of course, it's all being packaged to the people under the pretext of saving the world. You know, you look at the fintech conference, they're all talking about sustainable development. They're talking about green solutions and all of this sort of stuff. There's a new term even that's being used there called greenwashing. They're saying companies are pretending that they're green friendly and they're environmentally friendly, but we're finding out they're not, but they're putting out all this stuff. It's just like whitewashing and they're calling it greenwashing. People are pretending they're environmentally friendly when they're not. But what is environmentally friendly? I mean, sure, we need to be environmentally friendly. We need to do things properly, but the problem is that these people are attaching an economic model to everything. There was even one presentation that I saw by True News, and it was talking about fintech, and it said, we are becoming a worldwide community, a global community, and we are becoming united. And they even said in the interview that what unites us is that we all purchase things, we all rent houses, we all perform economics. This is what these people actually believe unites humanity. They believe we are united economically. 
And that's a pretty scary mentality for people to have, folks, you know. Economics is what has destroyed the human condition. Economics being superimposed over human mentality is what has created all of these problems. It's what's created all of this scarcity. It's what's been used to homogenize the world and destroy all of the ancient culture that we had. It's what's been used to bring us about to this brink of destruction that we're currently on. So people seeing this as the only thing that actually unites humanity is a pretty scary mentality for people to have. But that's what these people think like. I mean, that, that's the way these financial giants and these tech heads think. Yeah, and that's why we've got to be so careful in the way we deal with this as well. I mean, there's so much emotion out there and there's so much effort and so much push to hate the people that are doing everything. You know, we want revolution. We want hatred, hatred, hatred. Point the finger and hate them. Those guys, how could you dare forgive people? Rah, rah, rah. But you've got to understand that a lot of people that are doing this have no clue what they're doing. They really don't. They've grown up in dysfunctional worlds. They've grown up with dysfunctional thinking simply because economic thinking is dysfunctional thinking because it's got nothing to do with humanity. You know, and you can't blame the people for doing what they're doing. You can't blame a lot of these tech heads and a lot of these tech giants and a lot of these corporations for what they're doing because they simply don't know any better. And it doesn't do any good hating them. You know, someone said the other day, they commented on one of my videos, like, how could you be daring to say that you want to forgive pedophiles? And, you know, there's nowhere that I've ever said I want to forgive pedophiles. What I have suggested is that we forgive people that have done wrong, forgive people that have been part of the system and bring them into the fold. But, you know, construing this to forgiving psychopaths is a whole new ball game, folks. This is not anywhere that I'm going. I mean, a psychopath is a psychopath. A psychopath can't be healed. Psychopaths are simply what they are. So, you know, I mean, forgiveness is one thing, but people take these things to the extreme, you know, and you say something and people attempt to accuse you of saying something that you're not saying at all, something you're not even suggesting. But I think forgiveness is a big part of it. And sure, look, I'm not going to be forgiving any psychopaths. I mean, I mean, I'm going to be standing and defending myself if the time comes and doing what I have to do. But I'm not going to hate people. You know, I don't see the point of hating people. I don't see the point of seeking revenge against people. As I often said, I don't care what anybody did from this point. I care what we do. And does that mean I'm willing to forgive pedophiles and rapists and psychopaths? No, it's not. It's a whole different ball game. That's not what I'm talking about. You know, but people working within the system, bankers, police officers, politicians, people that have done the wrong thing because they've got caught up in that wheel, they've got caught up in that mechanism, and they haven't ever known how to get out of the current. I'm quite happy to forgive these people, you know, if they were to change sides and realize what they've done, realize what they've been involved with. I don't hold any grudges towards anybody. And even the people that have done all the bad things, even the people that have raped children and done all these bad things, I mean, they haven't done it to me, so I can't hate them. I don't like what they do. I don't appreciate what they do at all. But, you know, nothing's been done to me, so I find it difficult to just hate someone that has never affected me or I've never had any contact with. That's why I'd be a hopeless soldier, folks. There's no way I could go to another country and just shoot some guy because he had a uniform on from another country and someone told me to shoot him. You know, I'd have to hate him to shoot him. And I can't hate people that I haven't been personally involved with. And, you know, personally, I mean, even people that I have been personally involved with, I find it difficult to hate them. Even with all the bad stuff that's happened to me in my life. And I've had a pretty rough life, folks. I've had some bad stuff happen to me in my life. I find it difficult to even hate the people that have hurt me through my life. I mean, I don't appreciate them. I don't like them. I don't support them. I won't ever help them again. I won't ever trust them again. But I don't hate them. What's the point of hating them? It's such a powerful emotion. Why am I going to waste so much effort on that when it is such a negative emotion? If you hate someone, it doesn't actually affect them. It only affects you, so why waste that energy, honestly? Especially on someone that you've never met. You know, why hate the Rothschilds? I've never met a Rothschild. I don't like what they do, but why am I going to waste such an effort sitting there fixating and hating someone that I've never met? What for? Sit there festering away, hating the Queen of England all day. I mean, what on earth for, folks? Hating George Soros. I don't even know George Soros. What do I want to hate him for? I'm just not a hateful person. I don't think hate serves any purpose. And I think there's a higher harmonic to all that. And no, that doesn't mean I'm willing to forgive psychopaths and pedophiles and all this stuff that people accuse me of. I mean, get real, folks. But you've got to be prepared to look at things 
and bring a little bit of forgiveness into your soul and bring a little bit of forgiveness into your heart. You can't hate people. You know, even if you are in a position where you need to defend yourself against someone, don't hate them while you're defending yourself. I mean, if I had to defend myself and my family, even to the point that I had to kill another person, I'd be doing it out of love. I'd be doing it out of love for myself, love for my family, love for what is right. I'd be doing it because it needed to be done. I wouldn't be doing it out of hatred for the perpetrator because once I do that, I become the perpetrator. I become the very thing that I'm fighting against and I don't see any purpose in that. I don't think that it solves anything and I don't think that's a way to get out of this mess. I don't think that's a way to heal the human condition at all. But yeah. And that was a bit of a segue into some spiritual ramblings when I was actually talking about the fire and Scott Morrison and social crediting and all sorts of stuff. But, you know, I think it's all part and parcel to the same thing, folks. So, you know, I really think we've got to look at things from all perspectives and all directions. And as I've often said, you know, ultimately, if you really want to come down to it, this is a spiritual battle that we're facing. It really is. And with even with all the stuff that I've said, I mean, I get mad. I get angry at Scott Morrison. I get angry at the government. I'm angry. I'm terribly angry at all the stuff that these people have done to the world. But again, it doesn't cause me to hate them. You know, the anger that I feel for these people, it actually causes me to put out these radio shows. I mean, I channel that anger into positive, constructive dialogue in the hope of helping mankind wake up to themselves because I still firmly believe, I truly believe, that we don't actually need any violence. I mean, there may be a point where we have to engage in counter-violence because the system may get violent with us if we were to simply down tools and stop complying with our own slavery we might find that the controlling hand gets a little bit agitated and they send the order followers around to try to slap us back into line and in that sort of a situation absolutely people should defend themselves but to me that's not violence that's counter violence that is reacting against violence you know, sometimes you've got to fight fire with fire. You know, it's certainly not going to work if a police officer or a domestic terrorist dressed as Matt Man comes around and shoves a gun in your face. Putting a flare in the barrel of the gun certainly isn't going to help things. You know, you need to retaliate. You need to stand your ground. But we need to see the situation that we're in and realize that this is not going to be rectified through the use of violence. It's not going to be rectified through badly channeled anger anyway. I mean, there is such a thing as righteous, wholesome anger. And as I said, that's what I feel all the time. I'm angry. I'm incredibly angry at the state of the world. I'm incredibly angry at what the politicians have done. But that is wholesome, righteous anger that I have every right to feel. And I think that every human being on this earth has every right to feel. That anger doesn't need to be violent. It needs to be wholesome. And wholesome anger is based in love. And honestly, folks, if you love yourself and you love your children, you love your family, you love life and you love this world, I don't know how you could possibly stand by in the face of all that is being rolled out and not be angry about it. You know, we need some wholesome anger, folks. We need people to get angry. We need some wholesome, righteous anger. And we need people to channel this into positive action and stand up and make a difference in this world. Now, we really are on the crux of things, folks. We really are walking along a knife edge at the moment. At the start of the year, I said we were heading for a big year this year. It was going to be a very, very eventful year. I could just feel it coming. And we've seen a massive amount of censorship roll out after I made that statement. We've seen a massive amount of restructuring of things roll out in the meantime. And it's just going to be more and more in the next few years. This is why I'm pulling the pin on travelling next year. I mean, 2020 is going to be the last year I go traveling for a while because I think things are about to go seriously pear-shaped and I'd kind of like to be home for that occasion. I'd like to be sort of facing things on the ground here where I'm a little bit familiar with the territory and at least I have some countrymen around me. At least I know the lie of the terrain here. I think it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea for people to do that. Just be somewhere where you're comfortable. Be somewhere where you know where you are, you can keep your wits about you, and you know what to do in the face of a bad situation because things are about to get pretty ugly, ladies and gentlemen. The world is changing. It may yet change for the better. You know, we may not go down this dysfunctional pathway. We may not 
yet roll into this dystopian future. Who knows? I mean, there's a lot of good people involved in the tech world, and, and maybe they will think a little bit more clearly. Maybe they'll see what the social crediting system is doing. Maybe they will see the need to move away from it completely. Maybe they'll see the need to move away from AI, not to allow AI to take over as a new form of government, because that will be even more dysfunctional than the government that we've got at the moment. And maybe we can use all of this that's coming out, and maybe we can use this opportunity to lead us into a very bright and very positive future. But it's going to be determined on whether people are willing to admit the truth about things and willing to admit what is being rolled out and willing to admit what's coming, willing to admit just how much they've been led and willing to regain some portion of their own humanity. That's the big danger of this technology, folks. You know, Technology could be great. It could serve us really well, but we've got to make sure we are able to maintain at least some form of humanity through the process because a lot of this technology is removing that from us. It's important that we get that back, folks. We can't allow all of our life skills to be taken. We can't allow our children to be growing up in a world where they have no real concept of what reality is and what it really means to be human because the only reference point the kids have at the moment really is us. And most of these things, most of the things that make us human are being quickly taken away from us. And it's important that we maintain a little bit of focus on that folks it's important that we help lead our children into a much brighter future than the one that the powers that believe they be have planned anyway you know and we can do it we have every opportunity to do it like i said there's a lot of good people that are wanting to do a lot of good things if they can just get a little bit of focus well perhaps we can and well, once again, we have now reached that time. It is the end of the show, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in today. I think it's been quite an important show, and I think it's important that we get this message out to people, most especially the people in Australia. We really need to do something about what's happening in this country. As I've mentioned previously, I'm going to be speaking at Anacapulco in Mexico in February. You'll find a link to that on my website if you click that banner and go in to purchase your ticket via my website, you'll get yourself a 10% discount on the ticket. Or you can simply use the coupon Max Egan, and that will give you a discount on the ticket. I found out recently that the coupon is actually Max Egan. My name, M-A-X-I-G-A-N. I've been telling people the coupon is Crow House, and I've just found out that it actually isn't. It's Max Egan. So if you do want to get a ticket and get into Acapulco and get a 10% discount, that is the coupon to use. I'm very likely also going to be speaking at an event somewhere in the United States in April called the Zen Awakening event, and I intend to organize an event in Los Angeles as well for around about late February or early March, and I'll keep you posted on that once I've got something organized. In the meantime, though, for those in Australia, I am doing an event here on the Gold Coast next month on February 14th. It's going to be held at Varsity Lakes. It's going to be an afternoon event, probably start about 12 or 1 in the afternoon, probably go through to about 5 or 6 in the evening. So it's going to be quite a long event, just be me talking. I've got a lot of stuff that I like to share with the people of Australia, and so that's another thing to look forward to as well if you are in Australia. It's very rare for me to do events here in Australia, so if you are in Australia and you do attend to be anywhere near the Gold Coast for Christmas, I do hope to see you at that event it'll be good to get some message out to the people around here there is a lot of activism happening on the ground here like i said folks and i really would like to share a lot of that and just share a bit of what's going on in the world with my countrymen and hopefully help create some sort of a groundswell here last week i asked if anybody could help out if they could make a contribution to patreon i'd really like to thank all the people who heeded that call and signed up to Patreon for the month, even if it's just a one-off donation, folks. I very much appreciate the help you've given me. It's really wonderful to have such a great audience that responds to these types of calls when I put them out. It's very rare for me to put them out too, folks. I mean, I've never done any fundraisers. I've never done anything. I, I really try to avoid asking for money on the show. I always just keep it to thanking people who have sent any donations and I've always tried to keep it that way. I don't want this to be any type of a commercial venture. I don't think the truth should be commercialized at all. I don't think freedom should be commercialized. I think it's all about getting free. I think that's what it's all about. It's all about changing the human condition. And I don't think economics should get in the way of that. Of course, sometimes it does because we've all got to pay to be alive. And 
again, I'd just like to thank all those people who answered the call and who signed up to Patreon this month to help me out at the end of the month because that's going to be a real godsend. So thank you for that. But that is it for me now. My heart does go out to people suffering from the fires here in Australia and anywhere around the world where people may be suffering the effects of these incredible fires we're seeing everywhere. But that is it for me, and I will look forward to speaking to you again next week. Please take very good care until then, my friends. In luck, Kesh.